Hey, this is Mark A. Altman, and if you like our Star Trek podcast, Inglorious Trexperts, you'll love Disco Nights with host Chase Masterson as she takes you around the galaxy of Star Trek Discovery every week with new episodes premiering every Thursday night with special guests. Uh, hi. This isn't Bill Shatner, but uh, if I was, I'd be listening to the Inglorious Trexperts podcast. Why don't you? Back in the 70s and 80s, before the advent of VHS, chances are, if you saw a classic movie, it was on the 4.30 movie. With their famous theme weeks, it was a chance to see movies you never saw before and get reacquainted with some old classics. Now, join us for the 4.30 movie. Hello, I'm Mark A. Altman, and welcome to In the Shadow of Star Trek Week on the 4.30 movie. The human adventure is just beginning. William Shatner, take us out, is Captain James T. Kirk. Leonard Nimoy is Mr. Spock. DeForest Kelly is Dr. Leonard Bones McCoy. James Doohan is Lieutenant Commander Montgomery Scott. George Takei is Lieutenant Commander Sulu. Major Barrett is Dr. Christine Chapel. Walter Koenig is Lieutenant Pavel Chekhov. Michelle Nichols is Lieutenant Commander Uhura. Stephen Collins is Commander Willard Decker. Persis Kambata is Lieutenant Ilya. Gene Roddenberry's production of a Robert Wise film. Ooh, there's shadows everywhere. <laughs> As usual, we have our expert band of programmers here to curate a great week of classic movies, so you don't have to. Stephen Melching. Hailing frequencies are open. Darren Dockerman. Interesting. And Ashley E. Miller. The planet X is a suppository. <laughs> so a lot of you may be saying, why the shadow of Star Trek? What the hell is that, right? We were asking that ourselves. And uh, there are a couple of reasons. First of all, in the shadow of Star Wars, one of our first uh, shows was a big success where we talked about um, films that were inspired by Star Wars. Right. Uh, and that, that, that was a lot of fun. Uh, so that was one reason. The second reason is we have a new Star Trek podcast called Inglorious Trexperts, available wherever you listen to podcasts. And we wanted to uh, shine a light on that for, for you who shine haven't discovered light. it. Um, Make a shadow. A shadow of Star Trek. That's right. But just and a little one. So if you haven't checked out our Inglorious Podcasts, uh, Inglorious Trek Experts podcast, I hope you will. Uh, it's a lot of fun, and you'll you'll find some of your favorite 430 movie hosts on board. Um, <laughs> and Except then Steve. Well, <laughs> to guess what? You know, Steve may be making a special appearance sometime soon. So I, I wouldn't, you know. But, but, don't count him out. Don't count him out. Um, also, uh, this week is the 39th anniversary of of the release of Star Trek The Motion Picture, December 7th, 1979. That uh, monumental crazy. movie was released in theaters, I'm the sure. The day that will live in infamy? Well, yeah. well, you say that, but uh, for some of us, that was a day of, uh, of, 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 of anti-infamy. If Star Trek <laughs> was... <laughs> you know, yes, indeed, it was Pearl Harbor Day. So, it, it, you know, that was a, certainly a horrible thing. And, and uh, But uh, for, for many of us, the release of Star Trek The Motion Picture was the... the um, it was more than a just dream. a bomb dropping. We were witnessing... <laughs> I oh love Star Trek God, The Motion Picture. I just we were witnessing a rebirth. The rebirth of a franchise that continues even now to live long and prosper. So, Steve well, Melching... I mean, how many... I mean, that was really quite a thing quite a thing to see uh <laughs> to see a, a, a television series that had been canceled long ago suddenly spring onto the biggest of big screens yeah. in such a spectacular it way it really I mean, hadn't happened because yeah. if you look back at the time most shows uh that were popular 
you know, Batman being a notable exception, were compilation films. So yeah, Man from right. Uncle, um, uh, Battlestar Galactic, were stuff that already had been on television right. yeah. uh, when it was released in theaters. You know, this was totally new. It happened ten years after the original series. Or in a few cases, it went the other way, like Planet of the Apes was this movie sure. series that became a television right. series. When people stopped going to see the movie. So <laughs> I want to ask you real quickly, um, what was your first experience with Star Trek The Motion Picture, Steve? Oh, my gosh. I, I don't even remember because I did not see it in its original theatrical run, which is surprising to what? me because I was such a huge Star Wars fan and prior to that I was a I was a fan of the you know watching the original series in reruns and watching the animated series um for some reason I I had this block against seeing it. I mean part of it was it was just difficult for me to get to a movie theater it wasn't convenient I was totally reliant on my my parents to drive me to a theater and right. you know that I think we we had just moved to a new state at that time and it just it was difficult for me to get to the movie so i think i i think i actually saw it after star trek 2 hmm. i think i watched it on well, vhs you know, i never knew that about you see yeah. that's really interesting now darren i can't imagine anything could have kept you from the theater that day absolutely not i mean i was uh, i was you know reading updates in starlog magazine about it about the production happening and I, uh, I saw the first picture in, I believe, Bananas Magazine of the Enterprise, that sort of uh, rear that view. That was the Deep quarters. Space Nine of Dynamite Magazine. That's right. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly what it was. <laughs> um, and I just went, oh, my God, this looks amazing. And, I, you know, I had been a Star Trek fan for uh, at least six years by that time. So I was, I was very jazzed about it. I had gotten the Roddenberry novel, and I had read it beforehand. And so I was anticipating something amazing and I wasn't disappointed. I loved every minute of it. I still do. I still love that original theatrical release um, because it took this little idea of Star Trek that I had loved for years and years and put it on a canvas bigger than I could possibly imagine. And it was never that big again. And it, I was just thrilled by it. And I still am. What about you, Ashley? I mean, you're sort of the young Turk here. What, what, what was your first experience with Star Trek The Motion Picture? Well, you know, the, the parallels with Pearl Harbor are actually quite staggering. I mean, because, you know, after that gigantic bomb dropped that utterly destroyed this incredibly expensive undertaking, um, FDR then uh, completely reorganized the Pacific Fleet under the leadership of Harv Bennett. So, you know, I honestly, I... <laughs> I actually, actually for, for such a smart person, you certainly say dumb things. I actually, <laughs> look, I actually love the motion picture. Um, and I, nobody. You have a strange well, way of saying Very it. few people um, were as giddy about uh, the director's edition uh, that, that you were so uh, responsible for um, as, as I was. That was He but, was the visual effects supervisor on the uh, Star Trek The Motion Picture Director's Edition. Yes, and I only had one note on it. You know what it is. We don't have to talk about that now. But Is it my uh, note? Turn it off. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. I know, right? That was the one thing. <laughs> viewer off. The, Why they cut that viewer off? It was the off. only thing. I love that. It's but, great chat. Like moment. you, I had read the novelization. <laughs> Right, because again, I had to immerse myself in story before I went to see things. But going to see Star Trek the Motion Picture was a big deal in my house. Uh, my brother was a huge Star Trek fan. We all went, but because I had read the novelization, I had read the novelization's description of what happens when there's a transporter accident. Yeah, sure. Oh. Which sounded horrifying. Yes. Because people get beamed up in their inside out and all this yep. other stuff. And my brain was going, oh my God. Yeah. And like, it's <laughs> rated G. But I'm, <laughs> I'm waiting for this to happen. And when we get here, I remember closing my eyes and covering them and going, oh, I know what's going to happen. I know what's going to happen. I don't want to watch. I don't want to watch. And then I just sort of waited to hear the, mm -hmm. like, bring it back, bring it back. And then I was like, oh, okay. So maybe it's not horrible yet because the screaming has stopped and I can watch again. Um, but I actually, I love. Of Star Trek it theater. wasn't your it's fault, Ashley. People. There's nothing you could have done. <laughs> <laughs> I, I uh, you know, look, my my experience with Star Trek the Motion Picture is fairly well known because, of course, <laughs> it's been chronicled in the, itself, in the height the of sheer screen. narcissism. <laughs> uh, it, it was chronicled in the movie Free Enterprise. This is my movie. <laughs> uh, and, and, and while the dialogue is, is not accurate, what actually happened was. Um, you know, December 7th, 1979, I can tell you exactly. I was in, in, in middle school or junior high school, as it was called at the time. And, um, you know, looking at my watch, waiting anxiously for school to end. 
and me and my two friends, Kevin Costello and, and Richard Gallo, went running from junior high school to the Georgetown Movie Theater in Brooklyn that is now Party City and <laughs> um, uh, got to the theater, plenty of time, uh, waited online. And when we got to the uh, ticket taker, um, she said, I'm sorry, I, I can't sell you a ticket. We're like, what are you talking about? I said, no, you're, you know, you're under, uh, under 17. And we're like, yeah, uh, obviously, but this movie's rated G. Why would that be a problem? Well, we had some problems with some unruly patrons in the theater recently. So now after 4 o'clock, we don't allow kids in the, in the theater unless they're accompanied by an adult. We're like, you, you, no, wait, this is Star Trek, okay? We're not going to be unruly. We're going to be <laughs> riveted to the screen. <laughs> and, 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 and she's like, no. And then this wasn't in the movie. I said, you know, uh, you know who I am. And she goes, no. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm Mark Altman. I'm Robert Altman's son, which is not true. And she goes, Who, who's Robert Altman? I'm like, oh, this isn't going well. So we, we get offline, completely dejected. I mean, and I'd been looking forward to this for years. I mean, this was a huge moment. And uh, I'm thinking, and I literally realized, I said, you know, it's almost 4.30. My mom gets home from work. She's always at the Brooklyn Savings Bank to deposit her check. She gets online. And, um, you know, there was before ATM. So, you know, she's waiting on a long line to deposit your paycheck. I go running to the Brooklyn Savings Bank. This is back when I could run. And... Um, <laughs> Sure enough, she's standing online in, in the middle of the bank, and I'm like, "Mom, mom, I'm so you say what? Forget that. You got to take us and get us into Star Trek motion picture right now. It's a matter of life and death. And, and, you turn and, death yeah. into a fighting chance. Because if, if you don't take us, I'm gonna kill the ticket taker. I'm gonna be in jail the rest of my life. So um, she, uh, she she reluctantly, with great reluctance, because she was never a fan of Star Trek in any way, uh, uh, takes us, and and we were just terrified that they would kick us out. So she said, you know, look, I'm going to sit with you and, um, and, and, and took us into the theater and we went to see Star Trek, the motion picture. And, um, you know, I remember from the very f first moment, the overture, you know, being completely enraptured. And, you know, for some people, the, the dry dock sequence with that magnificent Jerry Goldsmith score and seeing the enterprise, um, they say it's too long. I say Not it wasn't long enough, again. you know, I mean, to, to, um, basically fetishize the Enterprise. I mean, it, it's the most beautiful starship oh. ever designed yeah. for the screen. Uh, I love the movie then. I love it now. I think a lot of the criticism is extremely unfair. It's something we recently talked about on Inglor Inglorious Trexperts, our other podcast. Let me just address, uh, Ashley, your, your quip about it being a bomb. Oh, I know well, how much well, that's funny. Yeah. It was not a bomb. Yeah. It was never a bomb. The problem was that it had so much baggage of budget from 10 years of development on all these other Star Trek projects. Mm -hmm. Two other movies and Show, one TV series. Yeah. One TV series and carrying the cast through a lot of those years, paying them to be on standby. Yeah. This all was rolled into the budget of Star Trek The Motion Picture and therefore it was almost impossible for it to make money, certainly on the first release. Right. And yet it did. Okay. Right. You know what? I think we should end this podcast because I want to go home and watch <laughs> Star Trek The Motion Picture right now. But, uh... I just want to give a shout out to Mark's mom. What a great thing. Right? What a good mom to like do that for her kid. That's, That's amazing just... parenting. Well, awesome. she took me to two seminal movies. Star Trek The Motion Picture and, and The he... Hunger, which were both wow. responsible oh, yeah. for uh, <laughs> for my formative that. years uh -huh. in, in many different ways. I am now uh, borrowing oh that gosh. trauma at my therapy. But I mean, I'm uh, I'm I, I'm deeply appreciative to my mother, and and, and you know, look, she hated the movie. She likes when it jumps to warp. She thought that was. <laughs> right. I remember the end. It's like, mom, thanks for taking. She said, no, no, I I didn't really like the movie, but I like when the ship goes and there's this rainbow that's and everything. Funny. I'm like, that's great, mom. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, it's it's appropriate to you know mention this first because even though it's not in our uh, uh, stable of five this week it is the first movie that was in the shadow of star trek yeah true uh, because mm. it literally was yeah it, yeah it was it was a a bigger that's a great point you know should a it bigger be friday's shadow. movie you know i we'll see okay we'll, see. well look, look we should start talking about it and i think it's very important to say that unlike star wars where it was all movies that um were influenced by star wars this we're, can go either way. This, this is not only movies that were influenced by Star Trek, but movies that influenced Star Trek. It so could. when we say in the shadow, the, depending For on where the shadow. sun is in the sky, yeah. because yeah. maybe maybe there are two suns, so the shadow is being cast in both directions. So you have the the movies that influenced Star Trek, and then the movies the that were influenced by Star Trek. The light speed breakaway factor can go 
backwards in time and forwards in time. Because there are different eddies and currents in time. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> Eddie. <laughs> I'm so Eddie. broke. Wrong, <laughs> wrong, wrong podcast. So, uh, Steve, uh, st- why don't you start off, us off for Monday on In the Shadow of Star Trek Week? Well, for my, my pick, I'm going to go to possibly the most obvious uh, or at least the most entertaining film influenced by Star Trek and also influenced by another film that Star Trek that also lives in Star Trek shadow. Solar Babies. <laughs> and I'm talking about... Gleaming the Cube. Gleaming the Cube. No, I'm talking, of course, about Dean Pariseau's, uh Galaxy Quest from 1999. Mm-hmm. A... a uh, you know, everyone's familiar with this movie. Uh, it's, uh, it's if you're not, become familiar with it because <laughs> yes, it's yes. great. It's a, a film that was not particularly successful when it was released. You talk about a bomb, yeah, right, I, actually. Yeah, I, I remember seeing it opening weekend Bunker and Buster. absolutely loving it, yeah. and was so dismayed that it just seemed to be crashing and burning. Like I, I, I don't understand. You know, the, the movie was tremendously entertaining. It has such a great cast. You know, led by Tim Allen and, of course, you know Sigourney Weaver and the great Alan Rickman. So many quotable lines. It's both a deconstruction of Star Trek and a brilliant Star Trek movie in and of itself. And a love letter to it. A love letter. Yeah. It's obviously influenced by Star Trek. It's also influenced by uh, the documentary Trekkies, uh, in a sense, uh, because I think of the, uh, the uh, Gabriel Kerner... <laughs> Mm. From Trekkies having an influence on. I just the think that's the nerd kid. geek archetype. I don't. I don't think that it's... he. I don't know. I'd be curious to see if that actor was at all influenced by hmm. Gabriel's uh, mannerisms and Justin Long. Justin Long, yeah, because his performance seemed like he was based on uh, the way Gabriel came across in Trekkies. You know, I lo- I love the way the film has been described as the best Star Trek movie. You know, I've heard people say that when you say, "What's your favorite Star Trek movie?" Galaxy Quest. And there's something to be said for that. It's certainly, in a lot of ways, it's it's just wildly entertaining. It, it it captures the spirit of classic Star Trek in a way many of the movies failed to. Um, and it's just delightful, you know. And uh, some great performances by Sigourney Weaver, the great late Alan Rickman. Um, it's uh, got a certain a melancholy to it. It's got you know. Uh, you know, the it's cat- got pathos and bathos and yes. pathos and porthos. <laughs> and porthos is it? <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's uh, beautifully, uh, the visual effects are great. I, I remember being so excited the first time I got to tour Industrial Light and Magic up in San Francisco. And uh, we, we start up this staircase and there hanging from the ceiling is the protector mm-hmm. and the uh, the uh, the. Uh, Enemy ship. Right. You know, it's funny because if they were the sequel, they'd have a computer hanging there with yeah. a wireframe model. It's not quite the same that as the model's miniature. That huge, and it's gorgeous. And yeah. I just sat there. I, I took well, a couple of pictures of it and just stared at it like, oh, my God, I can't believe this is here. One of the things that I love about it is it basically, in it, not only are the human fans the uh, heroes of the show, of the movie, but the alien fans are. Yeah. The Thermians are fans of Galaxy Quest, it's funny. and and they've they've formed their whole their whole world around this show. They've built everything that they've seen in the show. They've made it real. They've made it live for them, and they've reached out to the to the people who were. What's in it. interesting is that one of the original ideas when Deep Space Nine did Trials and Tribulations, it was mm-hmm. the anniversary of Star Trek twenty fifth, I believe. And uh, the alternate idea that lost out to Trials and Tribulations was a sequel to Piece of the Action where right. mm-hmm. um, Sigma Iosha um, basically now instead of patterning themselves on gangsters right. was going to pattern themselves around the original Star Trek, right. you know, Kirk and Spock. <laughs> so it would have been very similar where they worship Kirk and Spock, right. you know, um, and, and, and it would have been sort of Galaxy wow. Quest, the episode. Right. Um, and they ultimately well, didn't do that. I, I, we, my wife and I drove... Uh, have gone to the Telluride Film Festival several times that Mark introduced me to years ago. Mark Thank and you. I and some friends had gone. To, if you've never been to the Telluride Film Festival, it's amazing. Um, yes. But we, Ditto. my wife and I decided to drive one year, and I planned our route so that we could go through Goblin Valley uh. and visit the location uh, that was used in Galaxy Quest. I'm going to disagree a little bit with the premise 
of this pick. Okay. Because I think when we talk about Galaxy Quest existing in the shadow of Star Trek, I think, you know, we are, we are <laughs> in some ways, we are dismissing the validity of the source material um, for this film. Because after all, it was based on a show that was great in its own right. <laughs> Galaxy Quest entertained hundreds of people well, it was actually on the air. People don't talk about it you know, as much. Well, it's but, they're know, on a streaming deal. Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, because the you know the the point zero 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 five share that it got may not have been enough to keep it on for an entire you know more than a than a season. But come on, back in those days, you know, a, a whole season if you had like twenty two episodes, that's like six seasons on Netflix. So I, I really think you know that that we should give more of a shout out to the original Galaxy Quest television. And I'll be honest, I I think that Galaxy Quest, the movie, kind of makes fun of the original show a little bit in well, a way that's kind of deeply unfair. Look, I think if we do a podcast about TV shows, absolutely we'll talk about the original okay, Galaxy but, Quest. But until that time, I think we should talk about movies. Maybe. Maybe. If it's okay with you. It's okay with me. <laughs> I'm just I'm just saying. Maybe Star Look, Trek is in Galaxy it's, Quest it's, Shadow. It's not that I don't agree with you. <laughs> well, but you do. <laughs> okay, guys. We're going to have to pull you guys apart here. Um, okay, so. That's Monday. That's, that's Monday. Monday. What a day. Tuesday, Darren. Tuesday, I'm going to go back in time. Far beyond the universe. No. Um, <laughs> to Forbidden Planet. Oh, fine oh. choice. Uh, the Adventures of uh, Captain J.J. J. Abrams? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's obviously a science fiction retelling of Shakespeare's The Tempest, where we have a ship landing on this planet after being warned not to and discovering this uh, old scientist and his daughter living there, presumably alone, uh, they have a uh, super-powered uh, robot guardian that the scientist built somehow. And we find that uh, the scientist has been in touch with ancient knowledge from a long-lost race that destroyed themselves somehow. And we learn the secrets of the ancient Krell race, and we learn... Uh, to uh, basically not mess around with powers that you cannot imagine. It also you has don't... a snarky robot. Well, well, he's not snarky. He's he's just he uh... makes beer. <laughs> no, he... Kavanaugh would love him. No, he makes he makes uh, bourbon. Oh, bourbon. That's right. Okay, you're right. I stand corrected. Beer, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's a it's a great cast. Leslie Nielsen. Uh, Richard Anderson from The Six Million Dollar Man. Uh, we have... Uh, oh, also from Star Trek, uh, from By Any Other Name, um, Warren... Uh, yes, Beattie. Warren... Warren <laughs> no. Warren Beattie. Warren... Uh, Beattie. 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 Uh, Warren... Uh, Warren... Uh, Warren... Warren... Von yes. Warren... Uh, Warren... Look, you we, know Warren. We, Everybody we loves Warren. Use, we try not to use the internet for this stuff. But we're getting old. But we're getting we old. senior moments. Warren Stevens. Old, I haven't even gotten to it yet. It was Warren Stevens, right? diseased yeah. maniac. But it's yeah, funny. Wait, you just described on. like Warren Stevens, at yeah. least three different Star Trek episodes. Exactly. It, the Cage. Um, Requiem for Methuselah. Yeah. What are little girls made of? Indeed. Yeah. You know, a a good story deserves retelling Look, over in, and over again. I'm so glad you said Forbidden Planet. You know, this is a 1956 movie, which I know we all grew up on. It probably wasn't even a 430 movie. It was something you watched on Saturday or Sunday on yeah. Channel 9 or Channel 5 if you were in New York sure. or Channel 11. I don't remember who aired it. But this is a movie that at the time really resonated with us as kids, as fa fandom. It was a seminal movie. I mean, it was a big budget MGM science fiction movie. You know, the, the the influence, you know, Star Trek had the influence of Forbidden Planet written all over it. And Even now, though Roddenberry said that he, he wasn't influenced, at, I think that's The whole idea that's that, that they're military spin, officers yeah. on a ship and yeah. they got a robot, they have a synthesizer, and the Krell storyline is eerily similar to the and cage. The captain's um, name was J.J. Adams. That's so I mean. And Leslie Abrams. Nielsen. Leslie, Leslie Nielsen was on the short list of people they wanted to cast as Pike. Right. Um, along with Jack Lord and, and uh, Jeffrey Hunter and... Uh, 
um, uh, Lloyd Bridges and Lloyd Bridges. So, what a but but lineup. anyway, the thing about this movie is it's great. Yeah. And and I think a lot of modern fans may not be as familiar with it as they should, and uh, they should check it out because it's really even the matte paintings and the way they do the hallways that sort of s- square arch sure uh, was a big influence I think on Star Trek. Absolutely. Uh, but I, I really recommend it. I, I just think it's such a great great science fiction movie. It's certainly my favorite 50 science fiction. And I love The Thing from Another World and I love War of the Worlds, but Forbidden mm-hmm. Planet, it, I love Day of the Earth to Still, but Forbidden Planet is It the... is head and shoulders above any of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because of because it was like a modern science fiction movie. Right, very much. And, and, and you can, if you've never seen it, you know, and you're a Star Trek fan, you watch Forbidden Planet, you'll be like, oh, oh. Oh, I understand. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Why this has not become a TV series in remake IP Frenzy I have a world that we live in. I have no idea because there it is are, Star Trek. There are efforts going on to do that, but this this modern age is very difficult. Yeah, because unfortunately, this is already like outside the sweet spot. If it wasn't right. made in the eighties, uh, then uh, you know they assume people don't know what it is, and and we cannot champion this film enough. So, Forbidden Planet, great choice. Uh, Ashley Miller, Wednesday. Okay. <laughs> what, so what part of the box first, are you in today? I need to define the box a little bit. <laughs> cloak and I, dagger. Cloak and dagger. So when I think about what makes a Star Trek story a Star Trek story, for me it comes down to this. It comes down to a human, right? A person that we can we can recognize, that we can empathize with, who is thrust um, into a very strange uh, situation with a culture uh, that is alien to him um, very sometimes with friends um, possibly even very often alone and that human must rely on um, his or her resourcefulness and science to find a way um, out of the problem um, certainly I, I think you know the having an ensemble cast that uh, that um, kind of bolsters the hero, uh, and creates a certain tone and a sort of a sense of family, I think can be important, but it's not a must. Um, and there are definitely some movies that I want to name just because I want to watch Darren's expression change <laughs> <laughs> when I say them. So uh, I, I've, I've narrowed it down, and I'm 100% certain you're not going to name any of them. Okay. So you're looking at my notes? I'm totally looking at your notes. Okay. I thought about, and I might come back to it, I thought about Wolfgang Peterson's Enemy Mine. Mm. Mm-hmm. I can see that. Um, in which uh, Dennis Quaid, Louis Gossett Jr., basically, you know, they're aliens. Well, Dennis Quaid is a human. Louis Gossett Jr. plays the alien. Um, they are in the middle of this interstellar war. They end up on this planet um, surviving respective crashes of their ships. Um, they carry out the war on the planet until they realize they need each other to survive and then, weirdly, to deliver Louis Gossett Jr.'s baby. Based it's on his... the uh, Barry Long Year short story or novel, and it was a huge influence on many episodes of Next Generation. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's it's a fantastic movie. It's Wolfgang Peterson. The effects don't necessarily hold up, right. but, the, but the film holds up. Um, okay. So, my second choice, and you're this is. I'm just watching you, and you're gonna like practice your your uh, oh, your God. stone My face. poker face. Ready? Yeah, I think so. So this is the story about, and this, by the way, it's a time travel story. Army of Darkness. Hmm. In which Bruce okay. Campbell plays Ash, um, who travels back in time mm. and with this incredible uh, ship that's a kind of a an Oldsmobile, um, lands in this alien world, which Mm. is back in the time of the Deadites in medieval times. Um, And he ultimately has to science the shit, you know, out of his problem of getting home and defeating the Deadites and, you know, and uh, and rescuing the girl and all sort of like the stuff that we sort of associate with like the adventure. Sounds like a great Game of Thrones spinoff. Right. (laughs) But here's where I actually landed. Oh, I like think it. it owes more to Mark Twain than it does Star it, it Trek. It does. It does. But it fits the parameters of, like, in you can see. The shadow of like, Mark Twain. Well, it, <laughs> shadow, it fits your parameters. It fits my parameters. <laughs> it, it's lacking little things like it's not science fiction, although it uses science. However, comma, here's what my real answer is. Um, I'm going to go a little bit outside of the box, but only a little <laughs> bit, and say Guardians of the Galaxy. Hmm. 
yeah, okay. right? Legit. Um, and for those of you who don't know what that is, Jeez. what planet are you from? <laughs> um, no, Guardians of the Galaxy was such a revelation because it was so different um, from any movie that Marvel had done uh, previous to that. It was their first attempt at doing space opera. And it really resembles Star Trek more than it does Star Wars because, um, you know, Star-Lord, man, Star-Lord. Is he's a human? He's a regular guy. He's like us. You know, we can we can absolutely identify with this guy. Like he shares certain cultural touchstones with us. That becomes very important in the film. Um, he is um, kind of surrounded by this alien crew. But here's the thing about it, right? What Star Trek ultimately was about was about how the other, how the aliens that we encounter, you know, these creatures that we can't understand that are strange and weird and sometimes even frightening are more like us than we can right. possibly imagine. And nothing drives this home more than the end of that movie. First of all, by the end of that movie, you sort of see how all of these strange people from, you know, Drax the Destroyer to Rocket, you know, to Gamora, it, they're all human, but the most human character of all is Groot, who... You know, he's strange, he's weird, he's this special effect, he's a tree, but he sacrifices himself for the greater good because the good of the many outweighs the good of the few or the one. Um, and it's actually quite a beautiful and smart story on top of being extremely entertaining and really bringing that sense of family and fun um, that we get, I think, from so many of our favorite Star Trek episodes. So while obviously... You know, nobody said, you know what, I'm going to make a Star Trek movie, but call it Guardians of the Galaxy. I don't think you can say that James Gunn was not influenced uh, by that. Uh, well, you know, here's the thing about James, you know, who I've worked with. I produced one of his early movies, the, the specials, and I love James. And, you know, to his credit, this is a guy who hasn't changed in 20 years. He's just as nice and... Uh, uh, fun and smart and and just a decent human being, which is a rarity in this business. But um, he is definitely much more of a Star Wars fan. I've never known him to really talk about Star Trek or been influenced by Star Trek, whereas he's a huge Star Wars fan. So, uh, I, you know, I'm not sure he was necessarily influenced by Star Trek, but your arguments are compelling because, indeed, it is about a dysfunctional, broken family that comes together through adversity, which is if Star, if that's not Star Trek, what is? So, um, you know, I, I, I feel it's a very legitimate uh, pick, even though I'm not sure that uh, James Gunn would agree with you. But right. also, I don't think it conforms to one of your set rules. Okay. And that there is no sciencing going on. There's no, no sciencing? There's no I mean, sciencing. No yeah. I mean, I, and, and you, you, you stated that as one of the requirements, you know, well, through, through brains and science. There ain't no science I think in Guardians that of the it, Galaxy. That it can be, but I think the thing that that outweighs that in this case is is there is a male protagonist that makes out with a green girl. That's right. <laughs> so yeah. I feel like that qualifies it to exist. In to the me, it comes down to the Star character Trek. drama. It, that's the thing that Guardians is most interested in. It's most interested in the relationships between those characters. Agreed. And but good Star Wars is most <laughs> absolutely it is. <laughs> absolutely it is. Okay, good Star Wars. That's what I said. Good <laughs> Star Wars. Um, yes, no, maybe so. Uh, but again, it's like I, I I rest my case on it. I mean, you're right in that it's not there's not like a big science fiction idea that's like. Hey, in fact, in some I'm ways, army of darkness. Your rules. Can army I take of, out yeah? back my vote for the Untouchables? Oh, wait. Uh, <laughs> sorry. No, have we aired that okay. yet? The Untouchables, <laughs> is, the Untouchables actually is also a Star, tr a Star Trek story, <laughs> actually. What? The, the Untouchables is actually a Star Trek story as well. Is it? Sure it is. How? A, a team of uh, of uh, smart do-gooders go and, and defeat the bad guys. And by, but they're by in getting violation of the uh, Prime Directive <laughs> by interfering. Yeah, with... and Kirk never hey. violated the Prime Directive. <laughs> there is even kind of a Starfleet. Yeah, in Guardians, the Nova Corps. Yeah, Nova Corps. Yeah, Nova Corps. yeah, yeah. I, I think yeah. he, I think he, he wins this one. Look, I'm, I'm not arguing with his choice. I'm just, just saying that my parameters, perhaps, that your were parameters too were kind of goofy. Oh, okay, that was your mistake. Uh, Laying know, down the parameters. parameters. Star Lord does use his problem solving That's ability true. to ultimately, you know, he does do what Captain Kirk would do. Yeah, he it's... fixes his cassette player and gets it to work, <laughs> which is science. And then he talks the computer into destroying itself. By seducing its captain. <laughs> Does he? Maybe. <laughs> I don't remember that scene. It must have been a different film that I saw. <laughs> um, okay. 
Well, Guardians of the Galaxy for Wednesday, which brings us to Thursday. Yes. Which five ones have you thought of? For <laughs> it was, it's funny you say that, Darren. You know, my initial thought would, might have been too literal because I was thinking about when Gene Roddenberry and David Gerald and D.C. Fontana and Susan Zang were first in the very early stages of, of discussing Star Trek The Next Generation. They would do, and, 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 and Bob Justman and Eddie Milkus, they scheduled a bunch of film screenings, some which included Star Trek Four, which hadn't come out yet, and um, they looked at... Uh, no joke, Solar Babies, because that was current at the time. But they also looked at Forbidden Planet and another film, Gene Roddenberry's favorite science fiction film, The Day the Earth Stood Still. Mm -hmm. Clearly a huge influence on Star Trek and the Star Trek The Next Generation with the robot, with uh, the idea that sometimes you have to interfere uh, to do good for, you right. know, the, the the good of the many outweighs the good of the other one. Um, you know, certainly Klaatu is a... Um, a very Roddenberry-esque character, and he later developed a, a, a novel and a, a pilot called *Report from Earth*, mm -hmm. which uh, you know showed a great deal of influence of Day of the Earth Still*. But I couldn't go with that, and I was looking and thinking about other shows that fit this paradigm. Maybe not, you know, Army science paradigm. Maybe not going that far. Um, Another film I looked at, of course, was uh, Gene Roddenberry's um, Pretty Mates All in a Row. This was the Roger <laughs> Vadim film, uh, softcore uh, exploitation film with Rock Hudson as a high school um, uh, gym teacher who is accused of being a serial killer, killing different co-eds on campus. It starred Angie Dickinson, Telly Savalas, and Ronnie McDowell, and the crazy Keenan Wynn, but more importantly, also featured Jimmy Dewan and Bill Campbell, who played <laughs> Trelane in Squire of Gothos. So I was thinking about Pretty Mates All in a Row, but I felt that in some ways it would really diminish the, the this show, the stature of our show here, <laughs> if we were going to um, put uh, Pretty Maids all in a row in the shadow of Star Trek week, I also realized that we would be doing a crossover with Inglorious Trexperts, and that it did it didn't didn't really fit. So I, I continued to sort of cogitate. rack my mind and cogitate and um, sift through the titles, and then I I, I landed on uh, one of my favorite sci fi comedies, Sleeper, in which uh, uh, Woody Allen is Miles Monroe who manages a health food store, wakes up in the year 2173 and has to confront uh, uh, how different the future is. Uh, it, it had a little bit of a Simon Earth to it. It had uh, a little bit, a lot of tomorrow is yesterday in it um, as he finds himself coping with the year of uh, uh, 2173. But uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't quite get on board with that either. I certainly couldn't nominate Free Enterprise. <laughs> um, Robert Martin Burnett's wonderful um, homage to Star Trek, uh, although it clearly exists in the shadow of, of Star Trek and features William Shatner playing himself, uh, as much as I love that film for a variety of reasons, which we won't talk about now. Uh, so I settled on, and, and, and here's my question to you. I, no, I, I settled on, this is what I settled on. Destination Moonbase Alpha. Wow. Destination Moonbase <laughs> Alpha is a compilation film of two episodes of Space 1999, The Bringers of Wonder. Now, Space 1999, while its production design was greatly influenced by 2001 and Kubrick, in fact, leading to a lawsuit uh, from uh, Kubrick over its um, uh, similarities uh, uh, and in its in its design and the, the Brian Johnson special effects. They shot effects. it in the same moon base as they did in uh, 2001. <laughs> yeah. But on the very uh, same it, moon. no one would argue <laughs> that narratively, in terms of its uh, insane storyline, the Earth is blown out of Earth's orbit when the nuclear waste dump on the moon explodes and sends the moon hurtling through the galaxy <laughs> at forces beyond cosmic imagination. A, a trek um, of sorts um, through the stars. It is clearly... Uh, hugely influenced by Star Trek. It stars Martin Landau and Barbara Bain. Uh, and, of course, uh, Catherine Schell from Under Majesty's Secret Service is Maya, the shape-changing alien, which sort of was the precursor to Manimal. Her and uh, Destination really Moonbase Alpha, even oh. though it's based and, on probably Barry, the two... Barry Morris is as the science Well, not officer. in not in this, not because in this one, oh, he this was only in the first second, season. Oh, second season. So I, I, even though I would argue that Bringers of Wonder is probably the great greatest ep it is the city on the edge of forever of space 1999 it is the um uh, martian uh will the real martian please stand up or monsters do a maple street of space 1999 um uh, it is the um <laughs> it, it, you know which is you know not it's still space 1999 but all that said uh being the best of a mediocre show 
it had the greatest one sheet I've ever seen. I don't know if you've seen the Destination Moonbase Alpha one sheet, but it's gorgeous. And uh, I would love to possess it one day. And if any of our um, listeners want to send me one, I would <laughs> I'd love, to, love to get one. But I'm, I'm going to go with Destination Moonbase Alpha because to me, Space 1999 it's beyond the shadow of Star Trek. It's ripping Star Trek off. And and we do these shadow <laughs> shows. That, for me, is what I'm really looking for. You know, a true ripoff. I, I, honestly, I think that Space 1999 rips off from Star Trek less than Star Trek The Next Generation rips off from Space 1999. How so? Um, it has very similar uniforms. Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it has, uh, you know, attention to many more... Uh, standard characters mm. you know uh, that uh, you know the group of characters that we have to deal with every episode uh, and it also has uh, one of the things that struck me about Space 1999 was that it had the creepy factor mm. of, of yes. being out in space yes. and a lot of it had to do with the uh, the music and the, the way things were shot and um, it had a great score yeah it did. you know that great uh, 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 you know, score which I don't think is in Destination Moon Base Alpha that the, the, those opening credits, and of course it was changed for the second it was season. Changed for the second but season. if you remember uh, the first season of Space 1999, it um, it, it flashed this episode, this episode, and which showed clips from the episode because the pace was so glacial on Space 1999 right. that unless you made it look exciting, you would never make it through the whole show. Well, they, they tricked the audience into watching each episode. But and it's funny because when we were writing our book, so say we all, um, right. we asked Ron Moore if that was the idea behind. Um, the Battlestar Galactic opening credits because they did the same thing where they would show scenes from the episode. He said, yes, Space 1999 was the influence on the Battlestar Galactica opening credits, which was amazing to me. So when we do our In the Shadow of Space 1999 episode, <laughs> we'll be sure to mention Battlestar Galactica. Galactica. Um, <laughs> I, I think you're stretching the premise incredibly thin on this one, but I'll, I'll, I'll let You'll you go allow with it? that. It's my uh, job. Wow, I thought this was right in the sweet spot. <laughs> Maybe. I, th- I thought I mean, this it, was right in the sweet spot. You know, I mean, do you think like Starship Troopers would have been more appropriate? Absolutely. Okay, well, maybe that'll be Friday. Because maybe. my pick for Thursday is Destination, Destination Moonbase Moon Alpha, Alpha, starring Martin Landau and Barbara Bain in the <laughs> uh, classic uh, Bringers of Wonder episode, which was actually a pretty cool episode because they think this rescue party has come from Earth and it's all the people they love, the new back on Earth. It's very convenient that all these people, and it's shape-changing aliens that right. want to take over Moonbase Alpha. And um, it, it, I think is it, if it's not the last episode, it's, it's certainly the penultimate episode yeah, of second season. Right. And, and it, it really, to me, along with... Um, uh, um, I forget War Games uh, and Breakaway, which is the original pilot, is sort of one of the high points of um, Space 1999, right. which is damning it well, with faint and, praise. And also, you're not mentioning that the second season was produced by Fred Freiberger, I'm who, not. Oh, Fred. who uh, produced the third season of uh, Star Trek. Well, you so. just made my point for me. It truly, <laughs> well, the reason he was hired was because he had done Star Trek. That was why he was hired for Space 1999. And obviously, none of Game, them had ever set, seen match. None the of them had ever set, seen, <laughs> but it's still a TV show. Well, I, it's only a TV show. Was it was was that compilation ever released theatrically? Like, yes, yes, it was. Okay, oh, yeah. well then in that case we in allowed it Europe. for Battlestar Galactica. In Europe, it, it was. It, Destination Moonbase Alpha was absolutely released theatrically, and I would not be as foolish to suggest <laughs> something Which, that had only been released for TV because I, I know that would not be acceptable. Nor would I present a movie. Uh, which did not have people sciencing the shit out of that stuff uh, yeah. when we're doing in the shadow of Star Trek, which clearly requires science ish. Blinding yeah. me with I, science, Fred. First, I, I personally love Space 1999. And I think the reason is because I was so young when I saw it. You didn't it, know the difference. I really didn't understand that the pacing was an issue because what got me was the music and the right. creepy visuals and just kind of like the creepy things right. that were in the storytelling. And that just had me enthralled. And I the best that ships show. next to Star Trek. Did. I had the eagle. You know, it's, I had all of that stuff. I loved like their freaking ray guns, man. Those were cool right? as shit. The stapler? Yeah. I love that. I love that. I know. It's true. It had, I mean, it really had. You know, other than probably Matt Jeffries' uh, original Star Trek, it's probably the best production design any science fiction series, Space 1999. Oh, I love the sets. Mm-hmm. I love the costumes, mm-hmm. the props. It's it's gorgeous. And, and then the, the, the high-def Blu-ray sets are amazing to watch. They look yeah. so The Blu-ray sets? The Blu-ray looks Gorgeous. Fantastic. The high-definition, I know. Uh, they did a beautiful job with Space 1999. And, 
you know, there are some good episodes of uh, Space 1990. They're few and far between, but uh, it's not, you know, and I actually prefer UFO, which Space 1990 was kind of a spinoff of. It was supposed to be the second yeah, season yeah, of UFO. Yeah, oh, yeah. wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was going to deal with the moon base, which was part of Shadow's operational um, uh, triad. Def- defense of the Earth. Yeah, because they had the underwater uh, ship, and then they had the, the moon base, and then they had the other one. Uh, and, you know, and then, of course, the great thing about UFO was that the alien uh, uh, headquarters, their headquarters for de- fighting aliens was underneath a movie studio. Right. You know, it was like, where would you put, you know, the Pentagon of alien fight, you know, the X-Files underneath a film studio in <laughs> London. It's great. It's awesome. That's a, that's a show that needs to be remade. So like, for Friday, could we have a, a regular movie? Starship Troopers, I think. Uh, I, th- I think there might be some other contenders, though. I think though. so, too. I kept waiting for somebody to say Master and Commander. I was going to say. I'm not allowed to mention it because I worked on it. Oh, okay. Well, then we'll mention it. Well, I yeah. mentioned Free yeah, it's, it's a film about <laughs> a, uh, the crew of a, of a ship. Of a ship. That sets out on a mission, mm-hmm. a mission, uh, a dangerous mission. Uh, it's uh, a scientific and exploration mission, mm-hmm. but uh, there is also a military component to it and, and who are we fooling that movie is star trek 2 it's like they give him a ship with children aboard yeah right yeah. it's like he goes to the galapagos islands and that's basically you know he's on the genesis planet like the doctor is i mean eh, nearly yeah. everything boom 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 like and how you know um smile and jack like you know how he like lucky jack lucky jack right so how he like smile and jack <laughs> jack on jack. Well, he does um, smile he does smile a lot <laughs> even though he's russell crowe um you know his Everything about that story, in terms of the 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 sort of the heroic demeanor and bearing of the captain, yeah, absolutely. Um, the way that I mean, it just it feels like Star Trek. Too. When I first read the script, uh, working on it, I thought, oh my god, this is going to be the best Star Trek movie ever. Yeah. Well, it's funny, you know, you look at uh, movies that were influenced by Star Trek. I mean, another movie uh, that was clearly influenced by Star Trek Two is X Two. The Brian Singer sure. uh, Absolutely movie, it was. Uh, which is a terrific movie, which shows the influence of Rathacon and the sense of self-sacrifice and everything. So, um, you know, I would I would put that in contention as well. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, and we're, obviously we're, we we can't include TV movies, or I would suggest something like the Horatio Hornblower uh, TV right. movies, which were clearly an influence uh, on Roddenberry. Uh, initially making Star Trek a, a foreshadowing influence right. uh, in literary form, and uh, and then the USS Callister episode of Black Mirror. Oh yeah, those would both be if they were eligible. They'd both be great, uh, uh, great. But they're choices. not because they were on television. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what about uh, what about the the Star Blazers movie, uh, Battleship Yamato? Look, I love Star Blazers, but that movie not good. Yeah, yeah, Ooh. yeah, yeah. Look, if if not if good or not good were. <laughs> You know, a reason not to include them in the four thirty movie, then we'd be out of business. I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say what's next, but you know what's coming. You know, the, <laughs> ba- the bad movies are cheaper to license for airing. <laughs> You're than, darn uh, right. Um, uh, any any anything anything else? Uh, any other shadows of Star Trek? Well, or? you know, uh, Fight Club. I'd fight Shatner. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, where's he going with this? And Crimson Tide. Yeah, that's true. Oh, Crimson Tide is definitely a Star Trek movie. Yeah, to mean, the point where it has explicit references to Star Trek. Yeah. And I just want to point out that I was denied during Under the Sea Week for Crimson Tide. <laughs> and I think Crimson Tide, oh my God, it totally is a Star Trek Which movie. Which is why I'm bringing it up now. You know, you have you have basically, um, you know, the Doomsday Machine in a sense, uh, William Wyndham uh, sure. as, as, as uh, Gene Hackman, you know, and... and, and uh, you know Denzel Washington having to take command from, uh, you know, the obsessed captain, uh, and it's another uh, another highlight of Tony Scott's directorial career, mm-hmm. along with True Romance, which we talked right. about. And Karen Kino did a rewrite on that script, which you <laughs> and can, he edited all yeah. the Star Trek stuff. Right. Yeah. He yeah. edited all the stuff. You know, where he says, Scotty, um, yeah. uh, you know, you got to get this engine going. We have five minutes. You know, and you work your miracles and mm-hmm. all the references to Star Trek. I'm sure there's some great Star Trek references in um, Crimson Tide are all come from the uncredited rewrite of Quentin Tarantino. Right. Well, I... I and would... they're waiting for a subspace message. That, that's, and they're uh, waiting for a subspace <laughs> message. So it has a little balance of terror in there. It, it definitely has a little doomsday machine in there because, you know, there's that Matt Decker influence and... and uh, there was, but not anymore. <laughs> um, so, uh, wow. Okay, so we got Master and Commander as a possibility. We have... Um, 
uh, Crimson Tide is a possibility. Um, I mentioned Starship Troopers, but I almost feel like I don't know how much Star Trek was an influence on Starship Troopers. Um, you know, the whole idea. I mean, it's Heinlein, so it's vintage right. classic sci-fi. Right. It's more better for uh, books to movies week, I think. Sure. Yeah. Because it's right up there with To Kill a Mockingbird. <laughs> you know, to Kill a Mockingbird <laughs> Star and Star then Troopers. Starship Troopers. Well, you know, there, there's a lot of parallels between uh, To Kill a Mockingbird and uh, Star Trek as well, actually. Well, Roscoe uh, Brock Peters did play Cisco's father yeah, right? in Homefront. Not to mention Admiral Cartwright. <laughs> that's, that's true. That's correct. Um, and plus, you know, stop right there. The whole, home. the whole, the whole question of uh, judging a, you know, quote unquote alien before you know the full story mm. is a complete Star Trek story. Yeah, that's true. And the quest for understanding that which we don't understand is important to being human. All good points. Um, let's try and lock this down for Friday, Steve. You, oh, have... you had also mentioned Star Trek: The Motion Picture. As a contender for for the shadow, shadow of Star, Star, Trek. Trek. Star Trek, that's that's true. That's a kind of a self licking ice cream cone. <laughs> <laughs> but they do they do wow. use science. They do now. Well, <laughs> radio. If you're off radio. radio, would you consider The Martian uh, yeah. something in the shadow of Star Trek? Uh, it was uh, a scientific mission they on another planet. The it goes they have awry. A There's like mm. a pro- yeah. He There's a B story science. and an A story. I There's don't think Star Trek mission. ever grew potatoes, though. <laughs> Certainly not out of poop. I mean, I wonder, is Drew Goddard a Star Trek fan? I mean, you know. I mean, how much was, was Star Trek uh, oh, it was uh, influenced? Oh, um, oh, gosh. Oh, the, by, by uh, yeah, JPL scientist. Right, yeah. Uh, I am i can't imagine he's not a fan of Star Trek. Because yeah. all those that's scientists pretty much a job requirement. Star Trek. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What's your favorite Star Trek that's a That's a great, I think, the, the Martian's <laughs> a, great, uh, a great suggestion. What do you think, Darren? You know, I'm I'm indifferent about it. I'm not really a big fan of The Martian because I'm not a fan of the book. Mm. Um, I just hate the main character in it. So other than that, it's great. I, but... I kind of agree. Like, I mean, I think like um, it's. I get that it's totally a Star Trek movie. I just don't know that it's a Star Trek movie I like. Right. Okay. That well, I think you know this is all about stuff statement. we like. So yeah. Um, I, like I, I would argue, uh, Star Trek: The Motion Picture is a great suggestion. I thought Crimson Tide was a great suggestion. Just desperate to get Crimson Tide in here somewhere. <laughs> you know, um, we I, made him I like eat Master it. Master and Commander. Oh, I think that's a great suggestion. But it doesn't have a nuclear submarine in it, <laughs> but doesn't it? it Mark? But it does have the Mutara Nebula. Nebula. So that's right. It, it has the Mutara Nebula. That's right. And he stayed at his post when the trainees ran. That he did. Yeah. Why'd you bring him to the bridge? It does not have that great score by Hans Zimmer that I love so much. The funny thing was. When I was working on the movie, I, you know, I got to stand on the deck of the surprise on our the big surprise yeah on our big gimbaled uh, ship out down there in Baja, and I Baja. had Baja Baja, <laughs> Baja California. Sirens are forever <laughs> reference for you. Deep and touch. I I had I had my iPod with me, and I had um, music from uh, you know Corn Gold uh, from Captain Blood mm. and the Seahawk, um, and. I would stand on the deck of the surprise, look up at the riggings, and play this music. Mm. And it was amazing. The movie ca- turned out completely different from that because of the of the of the soundtrack that they did. Mm. It was much more period uh, uh, music and much more uh, uh, reserved for that. It, it wasn't a Hollywood uh, swashbuckler. It was like being there. Mm. In the time, and I think that's one of the more magical things about it. God, I'm going to get untouchable again. I can't believe this. <laughs> I, I, I like the Star Trek the Motion Picture idea, frankly, because it is the 39th anniversary of Star Trek the Motion Picture, and you know, it really it's so interesting because a lot of people at the time said this doesn't feel like Star Trek, but indeed, in quite it was Star Trek. It, 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 every fiber of its existence was Star Trek. Even Shatner and Nimoy didn't think it was Star Trek, and they were wrong. Yeah. We, no, I, I agree. I, I, agree. I just I feel like what a great way to, to to you know put an exclamation point on the end of in the shadow of Star Trek week with Star Trek the motion picture, especially because this is a movie we all love that much like Rodney Dangerfield gets no respect. And 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 you know I think any time we can shine a light on this remarkable film, uh, we should take well, that opportunity. It's a film that both 
according to the mandate, both exists in the shadow of Star Trek and yet casts its mm-hmm. own shadow and helped re- re-energize the franchise. <laughs> Energize. <laughs> and, uh, and, and spawn a whole new series of films, which in turn spawn the next generation, which right. in turn spawned, spawned everything, everything else. Begat. You know. Begat. And it's very Begat. modular because you could put it in the shadow of 2001 week. It would work just as well there. <laughs> That's true. Um, I'm fine with I'm ha- very happy I'm with fine that with choice. it, too. As, as long as it's the director's edition. Thank you. <laughs> well, it doesn't have that viewer off. That's it true. Um, yeah, Robert Wise right. didn't like it, so. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. You're right. He was, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> he was old and crazy by then. Come on. Okay. Oh, Ashley. Man, you're really <laughs> pissing off Darren today. I got to tell you. I don't know if we're going to record any more podcasts today. Um, <laughs> Certainly not with you. <laughs> the role of Ashley is now played by... <laughs> a crazy person off the street. <laughs> and no one will know. <laughs> Do we have anybody? We're, we're holding open auditions. Um, this has been In the Shadow of Star Trek Week. And I want to thank everybody oh, wait, for joining let's, us. Let's go down the film. So oh, Monday, thank you. Monday is Galaxy Quest. Tuesday, Forbidden Planet. Wednesday, Guardians of the Galaxy. Thursday, not Pretty Maids all in a row. What did I say again? You Destination see? Moon Base <laughs> Alpha. <laughs> and Friday, Star Trek The Motion Picture. This has been In the Shadow of Star Trek Week, a crossover episode with our podcast in Glorious Trek Spurts, which we hope you'll check out wherever you listen to podcasts. And you can visit our website at 430movie.com where you can purchase some fantastic 430 movie swag. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at 430 movie podcast on YouTube or on the 430 movie. Uh, also, you can follow Inglorious Trek at Twitter and Inglorious Trek Spurts at Instagram. And don't forget to check out our new podcast, which I just talked about, The <laughs> Ultimate Look Inside Star Trek, with some of your favorite 430 movie hosts and special guests from across the sci-fi universe. And it is still called Inglorious Trexperts. If you liked what you heard, please rate us five stars at Apple Podcasts. If not, please don't. We are a five-star podcast, and anything less would be a waste of material. Ha! So on behalf of myself... Darren Dockerman, Stephen Melching, and Ashley Miller, we'd like to extend a very special thanks to Bill Ritter and everyone here at the Electric Surge Network for making our show possible. We'll see you next week for an all-new theme week on the 430 Movie.